Well, hello, hello, hello. This is Pastor James Womack. So glad you guys are joining us on this wonderful night. This is the day the Lord has made. We can rejoice and be glad in it. Um, I'm pastor of Destiny Church in Fort Worth, Texas, where our mission is partnering with people just like you to maximize their life in Christ. I want to ask you guys to do something with me real quickly. I want to ask you guys to take a deep, deep breath. Inhale. Hold it. <sighs> Exhale. Do you feel better now? All righty. It's been a day, hasn't it? My day started off um, I'm on wheels. It's been on wheels the entire day. And I like days like that, but it's been an impactful day for Christ. And I'm excited to be with you guys on tonight to help enrich your spiritual life. And we're in the midst of spiritual warfare. But hey, it's all right. We're here to grow in Christ, to mature in Christ, to be all that Christ has called us to be. Can you say amen? Type amen into the chat. No matter where you're coming from, you just type amen to the chat or where we're coming from. Um, well, on um, two weeks ago, we talked about the battle for the Bible, and we began to talk about the um, authority of the Bible and just um, um, ask the question, is the Bible still relevant? And so we've got so much information going around today, and the question becomes, is the Bible still relevant? Can I still use it? Is it still authoritative? And I want to affirmatively answer that the Bible is still relevant, and the Bible is still authoritative. So in the midst of a relativistic culture and society, people question the relevance and the authority of the word of God. And the word of God is still authoritative. The Bible says that heaven and earth may pass away, but his word um, shall stand. And so we want to stand on God's word, want to live by God's word. Hebrews chapter four says his word is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder of joint and marrow, soul and spirit. And so it is quick and active. And so God's word is still active. God's word is still working. God's word is still the director for our life. And we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. Some believe that what that passage is saying, but we all know Jesus and Jesus will set us free. But uh, we can apply it to the word of God as well. So good to be with you guys on tonight. So thankful that you guys, I want to jump right in. Um, hopefully you guys were uh, with us on this past, um, past week as well. We talked about a biblical theology of war. And again, I want to did all my thanks to um, Dr. Roche Coleman and Dr. Bill Goff for sharing their insights and their wisdom with us. As we look at war, we definitely still want to be in prayer for those who are in the Ukraine. 1.5 million people are now refugees and have left Ukraine because of war. I read today where a um, where a um, maternal hospital, a baby hospital, was bombed um, on today. So let's be praying for them and let's not take that for granted. Let's pray. Let's jump into God's word. I want to share with you guys um, some additional reasons um, of why God's word is still authoritative, why God's word is still relevant. Because if you watch NPR, if you talk to your friends, if you're in university, they may suggest that God's word is not relevant. Let's pray and jump into it. God, I want to thank you and praise you for this night. God, thank you for your people who are gathering, Lord. I want to pray, God, that you would clear our minds. I want to pray, God, you clear our hearts. As we come forward now, God, to um, dive into your word, to dig into your truth, Father, to learn more about you and what you have to say to us, Father. We just pray, God, you be glorified through our time. Pray people are engaged. It's in Jesus' name, pronounce it all. Amen. Amen. Just type amen into your chat. We can see it um, here internally as well. And so anyway, uh, we shared some biblical principles last time. I shared with you guys the origin and authority of God's word. So when it comes to God's word, it's not just God's word. It's actually dual authorship. There's an element of human authorship. And then there's the element of divine authorship. And second, Peter teaches us in chapter one that God superintends the process. God oversees the process of what's transpiring um, in the communication of his word. We talked about general revelation, special revelation a couple of weeks ago and distinction between those two things and God's word. The Bible is special revelation. And one of the questions that came up um, is about um, the word of God and well, is it authoritative? Are there any lost books in the Bible? And there was also the question that was asked about, um, well, um, how can that be God's word? And there are so many different versions. And so we'll talk some about that on tonight as well. And so, um, you know, this past Sunday, if you went to church this past Sunday, we had so many points this past Sunday that tonight will be pointless. Smile at me. <laughs> Anyway, I want—I do want to be a little bit briefer on tonight as we share on tonight because it's kind of difficult after a long day to kind of hang in there and stick for a long time. So I want to dive right in. We gave you about um, eight reasons last time why God's word is still authoritative and um, 
why God's word is true. And we'll post these notes on the app as well. And uh, we talked about why we need God's word. But we said that, that the Bible must be deciphered, declared, and defended. First Peter 3, verse 15, be ready to give an answer. We said the Bible is God's constitution with humanity. In the U.S., we have the, the, the U.S. Constitution, which gives us our protections, our parameters, our rights for living. And so when it comes to Christianity, the Bible gives us our constitution. Um, number three, we said the Bible is not really man's opinion. It's God's revelation to mankind. And, we, and what we talked about the distinction between revelation. Revelation is not you learning something you didn't know. Revelation is God revealing something for the first time to humanity. And so God's word is revelation to us. Now, when we get a greater understanding into God's word, what's already written, or we have a better understanding of what God's trying to say to us, that's not revelation. We often call revelation, but that's really illumination. That's God illuminating. That's God giving us greater insight into what we're um, reading, understanding, or seeing. The Bible is the um, the Bible subject to being abused as much as it is to being used. 2 Timothy 3, 17, all scripture inspired by God. That gives us four purpose statements and how it's supposed to be used in our lives. And God's word is often abused for individual advantage. Second Peter teaches that God's word is, is not open to any private interpretation. So it's dangerous when someone has an interpretation that only applies to them, only applies to their group, only applies to select people. That's very dangerous. Um, the Bible is not really designed to get you through, uh, through your day, but to guide a life. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. ESV says that I would have our treasure in my heart that I might not sin against God. In other words, God's word is supposed to keep us from sin. God's word is to help us uh, frame life. Um, next is the Bible records the atrocities of mankind. It doesn't authorize the atrocities it records. It's like a newspaper. A newspaper can give you information, but it doesn't mean the writer embraces or endorses the information that's recorded therein. The Bible is not a science book. It's a theological, spiritual book. And so God's word is there to be used as a spiritual book. So I want to um, let you give those games. Um, we got plenty more that was there from last week. I don't want to bore you again with those things, but I do want to share about this week, what we have for you this week about God's word. Feel free to type your questions into the chat. We would love to hear your questions and give feedback there about uh, what's transpiring in God's word. And so God's word is still relevant. God's word is still authoritative. God's word is still to guide the believer. Um, here's another reason God's word is still relevant. The Bible's message is timeless and timely when you take time to engage it. The Bible's message is timeless and timely when you take time to engage it. And so um, behind that statement is the myth that the Bible is irre um, irrelevant, that the Bible is archaic, that the Bible doesn't speak to our day and time. 2 Timothy 2, um, 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. And so we don't have to be ashamed because God's word is true. We need to study God's word and dig into God's word. And that when you really understand God's word, God will give you illumination on how that word applies to your daily life. Number two, the Bible is designed for us to evaluate life instead of life evaluating the Bible. The Bible is designed to evaluate life rather than the Bible, I mean, rather than life evaluating the Bible. What do you mean by that, Pastor? So what's happening now is, is that people feel like, well, you know what? I'm going to take my circumstance, take my situation, take my understanding, and now come back and critique the Bible. When in reality, the Bible is there to critique experience, is there to critique reality, is there to, um, to critique life. In other words, the Bible sits above what happens here on earth and it critiques what happens on earth. But what happens today is we're trying to turn that thing upside down. It's kind of like, um, how many of y'all have kids? Um, raise your hand, type to the chat if you got kids. If you got kids. Have your kids ever gotten it twisted? Have your kids ever thought like, you know what? They're the parent and you're the child and they get the thing turned around. And so when, whenever we allow culture and society and um, recent scholarship to reinterpret God's word, we're getting it twisted. We're turning things around. The Bible's message is not validated by intellectual arguments, but divine revelation, creation, and power. I just said, I just, I just, I just said a mouth, a mouthful right there. On the second point, um, God's word is designed to evaluate life. You can look at Matthew chapter four, verses three and four for that. Um, the Bible says that 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 boy, the heavens were framed 
by the word of God. I mean, Romans chapter one, verses eight to 25, it basically talks about how God has revealed himself. And in fact, let's, let's just turn there. Romans chapter one, Romans chapter one, starting at verse 18. Romans chapter one, starting at verse 18. Um, and it says this, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress truth. Type into your chat, suppress truth. But what can be known about God is plain to them. And so watch, watch now, God, God is not hiding himself. God is not trying to play peekaboo with us. God is not hiding behind a curtain. God is not trying to make us jump over unnecessary obstacles. The Bible says, for God can be known, and for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his individual attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Romans 1.20 says that we are without excuse, and so but we ought to be able to know God because God has revealed himself through his um, individual attributes, and we should know um, who God is. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so what God is saying here is that is that it's not that people do not know truth, that people suppress truth. So this 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 third truth, the Bible's message is not validated by intellectual arguments, but by divine revelation, creation and power. Um, Psalms 19 one says the heavens declare the glory of God behind this um, behind this truth is the myth that naturalism is superior to Christianity. Naturalism says we cannot include anything supernatural anything beyond the natural to explain reality. And that's naturalism. Number four, the Bible is relevant. The, um, the Bible is still true. The Bible still can be applied. The Bible's message will never expire. Type to your chat, never. The Bible's message will never expire. The Bible's message will never expire. Matthew chapter five, verse 18. Um, turn it with me, turn it. Matthew chapter five, verse 18 says this. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So one of the things about the Bible is that the Bible made prophecies from times past. And now God, you know what? The word of God will not expire. It will not go away until every prophecy is fulfilled in scripture. Uh, number five, the Bible's not irrelevant. We have become irreverent and intolerant of his truth. The Bible is not irrelevant. We have become irreverent and intolerant of God's truth. And so one of the prerequisites to understanding God's word is that you are going to obey God's word. And so God is now saying, okay, let me give you the understanding first. Then you decide if you're going to obey. God wants us to have an obedient heart. God, I'm going to obey your word no matter what it says. And then we are committing ourselves to obey God. Then God gives us understanding. In John 7, 17, let's turn there. In John 7, 17, um, they are at the Feast of Booths. Um, it's a feast they had in Israel every year. It was a major feast. People came in to celebrate God and to honor God through the feast. He says this, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. For if anyone is to do God's will, and so boy, if you commit yourself to doing God's will, then you can recognize the authority and the truth of God's word. And so very often, if we're not committed to doing God's truth, we may not understand God's truth. Number six, <clears throat> excuse me. The Bible was mediated through man, but delivered by God. <clears throat> the Bible was mediated through man, but superintended by God, delivered by God. Second Peter chapter one says that God um, oversaw the process. In the King James, it says men as they were carried along and they were brought along by the Holy Spirit. And so what God has done is God has done his word. Number seven, the Bible is more authoritative than those who interpret it and preach it. I think I just said something. The Bible is more authoritative than those who interpret it and preach it. The Bible is more authoritative than those who interpret it and preach it. 
Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. This is a very important passage because we live in a day and time where one's interpretation seems to take precedence over the author of the scriptures. And so, thank you. And so he comes here and he says, uh, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice born from heaven. Now watch this now. There's, you know what? We heard this voice come down. So boy, they heard an audible voice come from heaven. And when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him. So the question becomes, um, when, when did this happen? This is um, this is um, at the um, at the um, at the um, at the Mount of Transfiguration. He and we know that how we know that he says in verse eighteen, and we ourselves heard this voice born from heaven. We were with him on the holy mountain. So we heard the voice of God in two places in the New Testament. Where were those? Let me give you a minute. Type into your chat. Where are the two places in the in the New Testament where we hear the voice of God, or it's recorded where we hear the voice of God? Give you a second to kind of. Type that in. Where'd you hear that? Type it in. Number one, we heard it at his baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then now we hear it again at the Mount of Transfiguration. And we know it's on the Holy Mountain because it makes reference here in 18b. For we were with him on the Holy Mountain. Verse 19, and we have the prophetic word. Watch this now. They, they saw with their eyes... And they heard with their ears where God showed up to validate the son. But watch what they say. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. He says that, watch this now, that they were, they were, they were, they were physical witnesses to the transfiguration of Christ, where Christ revealed his deity, where Christ revealed he was God. They saw that with their own eyes. But they said, we have the prophetic word made more sure. They said that, watch this now, the word of God is more authoritative than their personal experience. And so guys, how many of us, how many of us you know what? The word of God is more authoritative than my experience. What's happening in culture now, we're trying to make experience more authoritative than God's word. Even those who saw the transfiguration, that's probably one of the most incredible experiences. I mean, it beats going to the Bahamas. It beats going to Europe. It beats any kind of um, 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 waterfalls you're going to see. It beats any type of greenery. I mean, nothing compares with seeing the transfiguration of Christ. And he says, the prophetic word, the Bible, is more sure than seeing the transfiguration. The Bible is more authoritative than those who interpret it and preach it. So when it comes to teaching and preaching, we need to make sure that it's being explained and it's been shown to us in God's word. And so nowadays we're more concerned about how something sounds rather than if it's sound. We're more concerned about who said it rather than it coming from the word of God. And so we're more concerned about who said it rather than what is said. Number eight, the Bible stands apart from mankind's interpretation of it. That goes along with number seven. Number nine, the Bible should be interpreted, watch this now, in its literal, historical, grammatical, and cultural context. The Bible should be interpreted in its literal, historical, grammatical, and cultural context, not the personality, maturity, authority, or popularity of individuals. I know I still are that I'm looking we can make it okay. The Bible should be interpreted in its literal, historical, grammatical, and cultural context, not in personality, maturity, authority, or the popularity of the individual. So in our culture, we base things based upon well, who said it, um, how long they've been around. What's the size of their church? What's the size of their ministry? Um, how many likes they have on Facebook? That's got nothing to do with the interpretation of the word of God. And so what happens is we come and we think that what appropriate Bible studies, well, you know what? 
I'm going to bring everything I know about the Bible and about life and my experience and my understanding and then I'm going to interpret the Bible. Well, God says, you know what? I'm not asking you to bring a context to the word of God. I want you to go and find out what was the original context it was written in. So that goes to the historical aspect, okay? So watch this now. There's a saying when it comes to Bible study. When the plain sense makes sense, don't look for another sense. And so we're always often looking for a deeper meaning. And so the Bible cannot mean something that it did not mean to the original audience. We'll talk more about that on next week when I share with you guys um, bottom line Bible study, how to study the Bible. Historical means what was happening historically at the time of the writing. And so when was this written? What was the time frame? What was the location? Who was the author? What was the context? What government um, was in charge? Um, all these historical things. And then grammatical. So God reveals himself through his original text um, in um, Hebrew Old Testament, um, Hebrew Aramaic Old Testament, some American in, um, American in the New Testament, um, American and Greek in the New Testament. And so the question becomes, um, um, what were the words he used? And then cultural kind of, what were the cultural customs of that time? So the Bible should be interpreted based upon that, not based upon personality, mat um, maturity, authority, or popularity. Um, the myth is not only is faith mystical, but Bible interpretation is mystical. And so it takes time to study the Bible. And so we need additional books to understand the Bible today because the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek or um, Koine Greek or um, early 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 Israel Israelite history, um, early Greek history was not our original context. So to understand God's word, you got to understand the original context. So we don't go and get other books for the sake of going to get other books or trying to be smart or trying to be intellectual. We go and get other books so we can better understand the culture and the times of what was transpiring when God delivered these words to his original people. We'll talk more about that next week. The Bible was God's final revelation to humans, which should not be confused with illumination. And I shared with you all about that. The Bible contains all the preserved books that God intended and none are lost. Now, but this becomes a big issue. Well, how can, we, how can we trust the Bible when some of the books are lost? And well, what about the lost books of the Bible? I want to say that there are no lost books that God intended to include in the Bible that are not in the Bible. There are no books that God intended to be in the Bible that are not included in the Bible. What well, Pastor, what about these books we about called the lost books of the Bible? And what about the Catholic Bible, the Vulgate? And so let me explain something to you. So the um, that was the test of canonicity. The test of canon. So, well, what should be included? The canon is for the for the Protestant is the six books of the Bible. That's the canon. And so, what was the test of canonicity? What should be included in the sixty six? And there are typically three things that go along with it. Now, I'll show you about those particular next week. But one of those things were is what did the original audience, the early audience, say there? Number two was how consistent was it with other writings that were written during that time period. And so you also had people who were false writers who were trying to get their own personal slant across. So what they would do is um, they would not come and just totally write something that was totally contrary to what was accepted and authoritative. What they would do is they would come bring you, let's say, 75 percent of things that are true and then work in their 25 percent. I'm making those percentages up, but that's the concept. They would take a bunch of truth and then come and try working in their own personal perspective. And those books did not pass the test of canonicity, okay? In John 20, verse 31, it makes reference clearly that, um, that, that, that everything God said, everything God communicated was not contained in the Bible. But God gave us these books because these books were authoritative. To run. Let's turn there. John, the book of John, verse 20. I'm sorry, the book of John, chapter 20. And it says here at verse 30 and 31, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So in the book of John, he uses um, 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 seven, seven signs. Some call them miracles. Um, 
In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they used the term dunamis, which means miracles or uh, works of power. John used the word samion. Samion, uh, it means miracles, but miracles that are signs that point back to the authority of Jesus. So John says here that uh, now Jesus did many other miracles that pointed back to Jesus, signs in the presence of the disciples. And he says here, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, and are believing you may have life in his name. So the principle is that there are other things that were written, there were other things that Jesus did that were not contained in the Bible. He never intended to include everything that transpired and everything about God in the Bible. And so, and so, and so there are no lost books. God in his providence. And God in his sovereignty has put together a collection that has stood the test of time. We don't include, I think it's 13 books in the Pseudepigrapha. We don't include the 13 books of the Pseudepigrapha because we call um, Pseuda, which means false, and Grapha, um, um, false writings. We don't include the false writings because they don't measure up to the quality and the standard of the other biblical writings. And so the Protestant church did not include those writings. So if you got questions about that, um, feel free to state those here. So um, the Bible contains all the preserved books that God intended and, and, and none are lost. So there are no lost books of the Bible. Now, there were other books, there were other letters that were written around that time. And so we call it, let me back up there. We call them books that were really letters written to certain geographic locations or different churches. Um, at geographic locations. So they were really letters that were written. They were not really um, like books like we see in the library. They were really letters. And then we have pieces of the manuscripts. Number 12, the Bible's goal is not that you are smart, a smarter person, but that you are a warmer person. You are a more loving person. And so guys, part of God's word should make us more loving. And so um, are we growing in our love and how we relate to one another as we study God's word? You know, sometimes we can become extremely um, kind, um, I mean, unkind and mean and abrupt with people. But the more we're filled with the spirit and the more we know God's word, then God's word is there to make us more loving, to make us warmer. Let's turn there. First Timothy chapter one. First Timothy. And guys, I'm, we're going to be done in five minutes. First Timothy chapter one. Um, verse five says this. The aim of our charge, this is Paul talking to Timothy, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's the goal of the instruction. And so guys, watch this now. How, how are we responding to this? How are we responding? What's the purpose of the Bible's goal is not to make us smarter, but to make us warmer and more loving people. Christianity is not primarily intellectual. Christianity is not primarily intellectual. So we get into these intellectual arguments, but we got to be careful because we don't want to go to one of the extremes. We don't want to go to the extremes where but we have no logic, but the other extreme is, boy, all we focus on is logic. We want to have logic with a loving heart. That's why God says, come let us reason together. God is not against reason, but God is not only reason. And so today they try to make it an only reason. The Bible will prevail no matter how many people rail against it. The Bible will prevail no matter how many people rail against it. Let's look at two passages um, in Timothy. First Timothy chapter four, verses one through three. Now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. So we're living in a lot of times and people think they're following Christ, but they're following demons. Let's turn to 2 Timothy tap, um, chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, notice the word order, Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Let me ask you a question. It says, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Do those sound like passive, coward activities? And so, guys, people are going to contest the word. People are going to speak against the word. People are going to try to disprove the word. 
But he said, verse three, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having engineers that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Sober-minded means has the idea of thinking properly, endure suffering. Why would he say endure suffering? Because when you when you when you hold to God's truth, when you're dealing with people um, 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 who have itching ears, who accumulate for themselves, teachers to suit what they want to do, how they want to live, how they want to do it. When you're reproving, rebuking, and exhorting with complete patience and teaching, then what happens is people are going to um, speak against you and you're going to suffer. Say, wow. You're going to suffer for being true to God's word. So we live in a world now to where Christianity is not always going to be the majority. We're going to be in the minority. But remember, Christianity was born and thrived as the minority. So Christianity was not born where Christianity was the majority faith, the majority religion, most folks believe. It was born into minority and grew in adversity and it grew in the minority. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And then lastly, the Bible, I'm sorry, two more. The Bible must be respected before it's understood. The Bible must be respected before it's understood. And then lastly, that's John 7, 17. The Bible, the authority of the Bible requires faith and will always require faith. After all, it's called the Christian faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and by it, the elders gain a good report. If what was seen, I mean, if what was not seen was seen, it wouldn't be called faith. But it's called a Christian faith. And are you willing to put your beliefs, your lifestyle, your heavenly rewards, your outcomes on the line by not following God's truth. Let me get some questions here real quick before we close out. So I want to close it out here tonight. I'm going to stop preaching so long on Wednesday nights. And I want to uh, go a little bit shorter um, because it's hard to endure uh, what the seat, it's hard to bear what the seat cannot endure. And so are there any questions tonight um, about what's transpired? Any questions tonight before we close? I want to give you guys a chance to engage and interact, ask questions. Um, about this lesson or other things that we've been talking about. Are there any questions on tonight? All righty, well, I don't see any questions on tonight and I encourage you guys to come back here and join us again um, on Wednesdays. Um, I know next week is spring break week, but we'll still come on, we'll still jump on next week. I wanna share with you guys next week um, um, a template on how to study the Bible. Uh, now. Their entire class, I took an entire class, a number of classes in seminary on how to interpret the Bible. We had our foundational class. It went, I think, 16 weeks. So we're going to try doing it in about 45 minutes to give you guys an overview to help enrich your personal Bible study and um, to give you a template, to give you a strategy on um, um, on um, how to really study your Bible. I want to thank Miss Jamika. She said, no question, but the merit sessions are truly blessing my soul. Praise God. They bless my soul as well. And, uh, you know, one thing about studying God's word, you get a chance to, to eat it first. And so it's really been a blessing to me as well to um, study God's word and study some principles about marriage and apply those things. So I encourage you guys to go listen to that. You know, it's kind of funny. Um, I normally, I'm not one who does self-promotion. And so um, but I really want to encourage you guys to, to go listen to these messages on marriage, whether you're single or married, I want to encourage you guys to go listen to They can be very, very helpful to you. I think there's some, um, I mean, it all comes from God's word, um, but um, but I think there's some unique things that are shared that can give us insights on why we have some of the challenges we have, especially this past week. We kind of covered a lot about how to make, how to have a comeback marriage, how to restore your marriage. And so I want to encourage you guys to look at that. Hey guys, um, hope to see you guys on this Sunday. Um, bring your children out. Our children's ministry is open. Our youth ministry is open as well. They're getting the word of God. So I want to encourage you guys to keep fighting for your kids' faith. Keep fighting for your faith. Uh, keep inviting people to come out 
to hear God's word, to learn God's word, and to live God's word. Until next time, we love you. We're thankful for you. And we'll see you next week. God bless you.